Welcome, brothers and sisters, to our midweek meeting. It's nice to be together again. We're going to get our meeting off to our start by singing a song of praise to Jehovah. And it's about loyalty, which is a theme that's going to be running through our meeting today. So it's Psalm 124, entitled Ever Loyal. And then Brother Ben Ambrose will open with prayer. Psalm 124. Thank you, Brother Ambrose. So what do we have to look forward to for our meeting for this week? Well, we're, as we've mentioned, we're going to be talking a lot about loyalty. First, we're going to see the lack of loyalty on the part of Delilah and how we need to show loyalty in the congregation and in the family unit. We'll also see loyalty in the marriage, how that is so important and how applying Bible principles can save even a troubled marriage. We'll also see how Jehovah will demonstrate loyal love for his people when he acts to protect them during the great tribulation. And we'll see how we're involved in warning others of the coming destruction. Additionally, we're, we'll have a, a new sample conversation for the next couple of months. So we're going to see some demonstrations of how we might introduce that theme. For this these next two months. So to get things off to a start, let's now give our attention to Brother uh, Caleb Frausto as he speaks on, to us on the theme, Betrayal, How Contemptible. We've all been betrayed to varying degrees or level. Maybe it was by one of your coworkers, a close friend, maybe a, a family member. Whenever it was, when that happened to you, how did it make you feel? Betrayal hits us in our very core. And after you've gotten over the shock of knowing that you've been betrayed, you'll then be faced with multiple emotions, anger, pain, hurt, disbelief, and sometimes maybe even denial. How, how could they do this to me? They couldn't. They wouldn't do this to me. The intensity about how you feel about this and, and how deep it really hits us can depend upon a number of things. Uh, the matter that you were actually betrayed on and who actually betrayed you. 
Tonight, we learn about Delilah, and for material gain, she seeks to learn the secret of Samson's super strength. Let's read about this together at Judges chapter 16, and we're going to look together at verses 4 and 5. Judges chapter 16, we're reading together verse 4 and 5. It says, After that, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. So the lords of the Philistines approached her and said, trick him to find out what gives him such great strength and how we can overpower him and tie him and subdue him. For this, we will each give you 1,100 silver pieces. Now, it's clear from this account that Delilah betrays Samson. But now, why is that so contemptible? Well, first, we learn from this verse that we just read here that it was after Samson had fallen in love with Delilah that she then accepts a bribe to betray him. These Philistine lords offered her a very large bribe of silver to find out the secret of his superior strength. Additionally, this is so contemptible because of their reasoning for wanting this information. They didn't just want the information. They wanted it so that they could use it to kill him. A second, she persists in this request. Let's pick up that account again, Judges chapter 16. This time we're going to start off there in verses 15 through 18. Judges chapter 16, starting there in verse 15, it says, Now she said to him, How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? These three times you have fooled me and have not told me the source of your great power. Because day after day, she kept nagging him and pressuring him. He was weary to the point of dying. So finally, he opened his heart to her saying, A razor has never touched my head because I am a Nazarite of God from birth. If I am shaved, my power will leave me and I will grow weak and become like all other men. Well, now she nags Samson until he reveals his secret, her, her secret to her, this account tells us. The account tells us that his soul got to be impatient to the point of dying. This was absolutely exhausting to Samson. She broke him down, and finally he told her his secret, that his hair had never been cut, and that if it was, he would lose all of his power. If we look to our, our workbook picture here, it highlights just how contemptible this act was. We see it illustrated for here, us. We see Delilah, there she is, and she, she makes Samson fall asleep on her lap. And there, when he's in this very vulnerable position, she cuts his hair, symbolizing his strength. Because she was greedy, Delilah betrayed someone who very, very deeply loved her. This is a very familiar account to all of us, though, too. Many of us, we might remember reading this as, as children, or maybe you remember reading this to your child from the yellow My Book of Bible stories. But what's the lesson for us? What do we learn? Ask yourself, what does it mean to be loyal? How could I betray someone? Well, look back to Judges chapter 16 and verse 15. It says here, now she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? These three times you have fooled me and have not told me the source of your great power. Uh, looking at this verse, we see what Delilah was doing. It's clear to us, and we might know this as harping on something. And, and no doubt you've heard this expression, but why are the, the beautiful sounds of a harp equated to this very negative trait? Well, this expression is actually a shortening of harping on the same string, meaning to play the same note over and over and over again. And if we ourselves are, are applying pressure to our marriage mates, uh, to our friends, uh, maybe those in the congregation, simply as a means to get our way, uh, whining, weeping, nagging, the only thing this is going to do is damage our relationship with that other individual. And tonight, we focused in on this betrayal in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. There we're reminded that as Jehovah's people, we don't simply admire loyalty in others, but we ourselves are to be loyal. We're to be righteous. We're to be blameless. 
We are to show these qualities in all of our dealings, but let's focus in on just two ways that we can show this loyalty with others. The first way is that with our family. As marriage mates, when we're growing together, no matter how long we've been married, we must be fully present in our relationship. This means that we're growing together both physically and emotionally. We can do this by being attentive to one another. Uh, we, we can do this by spending time with one another. And when we do this, it's going to help us to draw closer to each other. Our focus within a marriage is by preserving our relationship with each other and by building a close relationship with Jehovah. We do this by studying the Bible together, regularly working out in the ministry together, and by praying to our God Jehovah together. A second way that we can demonstrate loyalty is that there are many opportunities we can do this, but let's look at the congregation. What if you have a close relative or a very close friend who happens to be disfellowshipped? Well, now our loyalty is on the line. But who is the most important person that we need to be loyal to? It's not that person who was disfellowshipped, but to Jehovah. He's watching us to see whether we will abide by his command not to have contact with anyone who is disfellowshipped. Another way we want to keep our loyalty is by keeping our, our curiosity in check. When it comes to things that are confidential, we wouldn't want to use our, our time there to, to pry, to nag, to harp, just to get all the details so that we could be in the know, so to speak. In the end, Delilah, she serves as a warning example for all of us today. She was overcome by greed and acted in a very deceitful, disloyal, and selfish way towards one of Jehovah's beloved servants. We learn from her example, and we ourselves strive to act loyally. Let's see this together, the concluding scripture in Psalms chapter 18. Psalms chapter 18, we're going to look together at verses 25 and 26. Starts off there, verse 25. With someone loyal, you act in loyalty. With a blameless man, you deal blamelessly. With the pure, you show yourself pure. But with the crooked, you show yourself shrewd. Think of all this anger, pain, and hurt that we can avoid when we act loyally to our mates, our friends, those within the congregation. And when we do this, our God Jehovah will always reward those who remain loyal. Thank you very much, Brother Frausto, for that excellent talk and highlighting the uh, danger of betrayal, the importance of loyalty, and the practical application you made within the family unit and within the congregation. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move into our spiritual gems part where we all have a chance to participate and give a comment. So let's give our attention now to Brother Sebastian Sierra. To begin with our spiritual gems, if we can get a reader for Judges chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Let's see, Ben and Ali Ambrose. One time Samson went to Gaza and saw a prostitute there, and he went into her. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here. So they surrounded him and lay in ambush for him all night long in the city gate. They stayed quiet the whole night, saying to themselves, when daylight comes, we will kill him. However, Samson kept lying there until midnight. Then he got up at midnight and grabbed the doors of the city gate and the two side posts and pulled them out along the bar with the bar. He put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the mountain that faces Hebron. Thank you very much for that excellent reading. So the question to begin uh, following that Bible reading, how are we to understand these verses? Sister Sawyer, please. Uh, Samson's primary objective was his fight against the Philistines. So when he arrived in Gaza at the house of a prostitute, he didn't have any immoral purpose in mind. And we can see that in verse three, because it mentioned that he lay there until midnight. 
And then he got up and grabbed the city gates and the two side posts and carried them to the top of a mountain some 37 miles away. So he had a definite purpose in mind in his being there. And all of these actions had divine approval and backing. Thank you. Let's see, Leroy and Faye Grimes. In further harmony with it in verse one of chapter 16, it, when it mentions Samson um, saw a prostitute, he no doubt knew that this would be a place he could find shelter because of her being a prostitute. And again, in harmony with what was previously stated, um, we realized or could say there was no immoral int intent as verse three says, he kept lying there until midnight, not that he kept lying with the prostitute or with her. Thank you for that. And Brother Dady, please. And Samson's strength was uh, God-given, as we see later on in, in his life, um, when he lost his strength. His plan wouldn't have worked without Jehovah's approval, and Jehovah wouldn't compromise his standards. So the fact he was still able to complete this feat of, feat of strength I meant he still had Jehovah's approval. Thank you. So it was very clear, right? Samson's was not, his objective was not immoral. It was according to Jehovah's will. Very good. So we'll continue with our spiritual gems with our second question. What spiritual gems from this week's Bible reading would you like to share regarding Jehovah, the field ministry, or something else? And let's get Sister Frausto, please. In chapter 15, verse 14, uh, we see that Jehovah's Spirit empowered Samson. And today we have examples of Jehovah's Spirit operating in um, the unity of the congregation and the organization, the integrity being upheld of ones who are being persecuted, and the growth of the preaching work. We can ask Jehovah to personally guide our thinking, speech, and actions by means of his spirit. And as we allow it to work, it will produce fruitage in us that is refreshing to others and brings praise to Jehovah. Excellent. Uh, Brother Harrison, please. In Judges 15, verse 18 and 19, Samson expresses to Jehovah that he was thirsty after Jehovah had given him the victory. Jehovah then gave him water, he drank, his spirit returned, and he revived. In the same way today, we should be conscious of our spiritual need knowing that fighting this world, trying to squeeze us into their mold, uh, enduring in Jehovah's work, we're in need of refreshment. But Jehovah provides that to us, just like he did to Samson with the publications, our Christian meetings. And we, like Samson, should make sure that we drink deeply of these provisions from Jehovah. Very nice. Uh, Brother Ambrose? Well, due to a serious error in judgment, Samson allowed himself to get in a position that led to the termination of his Nazarite ship. So was Jehovah finished with Samson then? Was he no longer gonna be in a relationship with him? Well, we see in Judges chapter 16 and verse 30, Jehovah empowered Samson uh, so that he can be used in a mighty way. And this was because Samson was genuinely repentant for what he did. So this is a good lesson for us that if we ever err or lose privileges, Jehovah just doesn't cut us off from his love. But like Samson, if we are truly repentant, then we can be used in a mighty way too. Excellent, thank you. He showed genuine repentance, a good lesson for all of us. Brother Sawyer, please. Just another thought on Judges 15, verse 18, after Samson had struck down the 1,000 men with a jawbone of a donkey, which is, of course, an amazing feat of strength. But in verse 18, he says, to Jehovah, it was you who gave this great salvation into the hand of your servant. So he really attributed his success to Jehovah. It's a good lesson for me personally, if I ever have any success in the ministry or in theocratic service, to always give glory to Jehovah. Excellent. Thank you for your comment. Sister Dady, please. In Judges 16, 17, Samson says, if I am shaved, my power will leave me and I will grow weak and become like all other men. Well, of course, it wasn't his actual hair that gave him his strength, but it's what his hair stood for, which was his special relationship with Jehovah as a Nazarite. So by revealing to Delilah that his strength came from being a Nazarite from birth, it resulted in him losing Jehovah's spirit and his Nazarite ship and thus his strength. Thank you. Thank you for that research. Uh, Brother Olivares. I 
Also appreciate the special relationship Samson had with Jehovah as a Nazarite and how Jehovah had empowered him and given him superhuman strength. We saw in these two chapters, he was able to break free anytime the, the Philistines tried to um, tie him. And so this builds our faith in Jehovah's ability to easily help us when we face challenges. And today we can rely on Jehovah for spiritual strength through prayer and supplication, and he can give us the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, uh, tranquility of mind that results from our precious relationship with Jehovah as we face trials. Thank you. There is no strength like Jehovah's strength. Uh, Brother Grimes, please. Yeah, in harmony with Brother Oliveira's comment, I appreciated 16 verse 3 where Samson in the, in the uh, strength of God's spirit was able to grab the two doors of the city gate and, and, and um, carry them up a mountain, which I'm sure those doors weighed tons. And it was a, it was a long trip, but uh, Jehovah's spirit empowered him to do that. Of course, today, Jehovah's spirit doesn't give us muscular strength like it did Samson, but it does give us vast spiritual strength. And uh, we can use the power of God's Holy Spirit to increase our comprehension of deep spiritual matters and make us mighty according to the spiritual man we are inside. And this is important because the warfare that we have today is a spiritual one against Satan and his wicked system of things. So we can use this spiritual strength in order to be successful in, in the battles that we have as Christians. Thank you, Brother Grimes, for highlighting our spiritual need. And we're going to have Sister Ambrose, please. Well, in Judges 15, uh, the Israelites failed to see how Jehovah was using Samson to deliver them. And then in verse 12, they sent 3,000 men to arrest him and surrender him to the enemy. Um, and this could have been very disappointing to him and maybe even angered him. But rather than focusing um, on their failings, he focused on the real enemy, which was not his brother's. And due to, to uh, other imperfections, we may be disappointed by the actions and shortcomings but like Samson. We can realize that they're not our enemy and Jehovah can bless us in whatever situation we might find ourselves in. Perfect. Sister Dady, please. Um, in Judges 16, 28, I thought it was interesting that Samson asked Jehovah, let me take revenge on the Philistines for one of my two eyes. So I was wondering why only one eye? Um, well, the Insight Books gives a couple of possibilities. He says, um, it says that maybe he recognized that he lost his eyes partly because of his own failure, so he didn't feel like he could ask for both. Or maybe he felt that it would be impossible to avenge himself completely as God's representative. Thank you very much for that excellent research. And thank you all for allowing us to, for sharing your product of your meditation throughout this week's Bible reading, and we'll continue with our meeting. Thank you very much, Brother Sierra. We appreciate it, uh, your handling that and, of course, all the fine comments of our brothers and sisters. We really appreciate all your fine research and meditation on those scriptures. Now we're going to give our attention to our Bible reading for this week. So we invite you to uh, open your Bibles to Judges chapter 16, verses 18 through 31, and follow along in the reading with Brother George Olivares. When Delilah saw that he had opened his heart to her, she immediately summoned the Philistine lords, saying, Come up this time, for he has opened his heart to me. So the Philistine lords came up to her, bringing the money with them. She made him fall asleep on her knees. Then she called the man and had him shave off the seven braids of his head. After she began to have control over him, for his power was leaving him. Now she called out, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. He woke up from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that Jehovah had left him. So the Philistines seized him and bore out his eyes, bore his eyes out. Then they brought him down to Gaza and bound him with two copper fetters. And he became a grinder of grain in the prison. But the hair of his head started to grow back again after he had been shaved. The Philistine lords gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate. For they were saying, 
Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. When the people saw him, they praised their God and said, Our God has given into our hand our enemy, the one who devastated our land and killed so many of us. Because their heart was cheerful, they said, Call Samson to provide us some amusement. So they called Samson out of the prison to entertain them. They made him stand between the pillars. Then Samson said to the boy holding him by the hand, let me feel the pillars that support the house so that I can lean against them. Incidentally, the house was full of men and women. All the Philistine lords were there. And on the roof, there were about 3,000 men and women who were looking on while Samson provided amusement. Samson now called out to Jehovah, Sovereign Lord Jehovah, remember me, please, and strengthen me, please, just this once, O oh God, and let me take revenge on the Philistines for one of my two eyes. Then Samson braced himself against the two middle pillars that supported the house, and he leaned on them with his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Samson called out, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and the house fell on the Lord's and all the people in it. So he killed more at his death than he had killed during his life. Later, his brothers and all his father's family came down to take him back. They brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtael in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had judged Israel for 20 years. Thank you very much. Uh, Brother Olivares, for your excellent reading. Very nice job. And you were asked to work on our study number 10, which is modulation. Modulation is to convey ideas clearly and stir emotion by varying your volume, pitch, and pace. Certainly, this was uh, a very emotional account, and you really did a fine job in bringing that to light. We noticed uh, several points, for example, in verse 20, where, uh, uh, where it says, she called out, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So you raised your pitch to convey excitement in that. And then later in verse 23, you said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. So again, raising your voice and, and for excitement. And then, but in verse 28, you said, remember me, please, and strengthen me. You slower, slow down a little bit to, to convey the importance of that. So thank you very much in doing a very fine job with modulation. Now we're going to enter into our apply yourself to the field ministry section of our meeting. And as we mentioned, we have a new uh, suggested uh, topic this month uh, for uh, our initial call. So let's first see an initial call video, and we're going to ask some questions related to it as we go along. When tragedies strike, many people have a hard time believing that God cares about us. Have you ever felt that way? Okay, so the first question here is, how might you adjust the introduction according to circumstances where you live? Any suggestions on how we can maybe just adjust that slightly, depending on our circumstances? Uh, Sister Grimes, please. Well, I was thinking we could suggest it for our area, um, in the field by basing it up on local events. So for instance, in this area, many were affected by Hurricane Ida. Um, worldwide, everyone have been affected by the pandemic. And then even the natural disasters besides the um, hurricane, those are topics we could introduce to ask if God really cares. Very good. Yeah, so good. Mentioning a specific tragedy that might be on the, the minds of people. Very good. And uh, Brother Sierra, please. And going along the same uh, train of thought, I was thinking more specifically, perhaps with the new variant of COVID, I'm not trying to be too negative, but something that's probably on everyone's mind at the moment. 
Very nice. Thank you for those uh, practical comments. Let's uh, continue in our video. Honestly, yeah. I want to believe he cares, but he hasn't done much for me, that's for sure. Last year, my father had a heart attack, and I just lost my job. I'm sorry to hear that. How's your father recovering? He's okay now, but we were really worried about him for a while. Mm. I'm glad he's improving. When we face problems, it helps to know that someone cares. How do we know that God cares about us as individuals? Please note Jesus' words at Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 through 31. Tom, would you please read that for us? Sure. Two sparrows sell for a coin of small value, do they not? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's knowledge. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So have no fear, you are worth more than many sparrows. And so the question here is, if you meet someone who does not believe in Jesus, how might you use Psalm 31, verse 7 instead? Psalm 31, verse 7 says, I will rejoice greatly in your loyal love, for you have seen my affliction. You are aware of my deep distress. How might we use, use this scripture? Brother, Brother Frausto, please. Well, there we clearly see that there is a God. And not only there is, there is there a God, but he deeply cares about us as individuals. He sees and knows of all of our, our struggles and the things that are going on in our life. And really, it's just a positive encouragement that we can share with them. Thank you very much. And Sister Dady. I'd also like to point out that um, David wasn't asking for Jehovah to notice him, but he was stating it. So this scripture gives us reassurance that, yes, God does see our distress. Very fine. Thank you. Yeah. Good. And as we see in the scripture, it doesn't say our affliction or our deep distress. It says my affliction, my deep distress. So it was very personal on the uh, part of the psalmist there. So we can highlight that too in our scripture. Very good. Thank you for your comments. Let's move on to our next part of the video. Thank you. So how detailed is God's knowledge of us? He numbers the hairs of our head? Yes. Impressive, right? Yeah. So if God numbers even the hairs of our head, would it make sense that he cares about us and knows when we're going through a hard time? Seems logical. But now the question is, how does God help us to cope with present problems? I'd like to discuss that the next time we talk. So our question now is, how would you offer a publication from our teaching toolbox? Brother or Sister Grimes, Sister Grimes, please. Enjoy Life brochure in lesson one and paragraph two. It has the question, how can the Bible help us to enjoy our daily life? And in particular, it speaks about coping with stress and enjoying our work. So that can easily lead into why and how the Bible is practical today. Thank you. Good suggestion. And Brother Olivares. And we also have there in our meeting workbook to the 2018 Watchtower number three, Does God Care About You? And it, and it gives further evidence helping us to see that God cares for us as individuals and even includes personal experiences of those who at one time doubted that God loved them and what convinced them of his love and support. Very true. Very good. So certainly we have many choices. We have the Will Suffering Ever End track. We even, of course, have the Why Study of the Bible video that highlights why do bad things happen and why do people die. So good things that we could uh, highlight from those publications as well. Thank you very much for your comments on that video. Now we're going to see uh, some real life demonstrations on how this uh, we can do our initial call. 
Let's first give our attention to Sister Ashley Dady, and she's going to be accompanied by Sister Doris Sawyer. Thank you so much for helping me get my internet fixed, Doris. You were very helpful. Absolutely no problem. And thank you very much for your patience. We're really sorry for any inconvenience this may have caused you. Uh, it's, it's no worries. Uh, you know, since you were so nice and helpful to me, do you mind me asking you how you've been doing? Customer service seems like a very stressful job to have right now. Thank you so much for asking. Very few people ask us how we are. Customer service can be very stressful, but I like this company. We have had a lot to deal with, especially of crazy things within the last couple of years, and it, it really has overwhelmed me at times. Yeah, I understand. There's a lot of pressure right now, and it's affecting a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Have you ever wondered, with all these crazy things happening, if God cares about what's happening here on the earth? Mm -hmm. I think God is aware, but I don't feel very significant in the whole scheme of things. I don't feel that anybody really cares about what happens to me, including God. You know, I think many feel that way, especially when looking at the big picture of things. So you say that you feel that God doesn't care what happens to you, but is there a way we could actually find out what God thinks? Hmm. I, don't, I don't know for sure. My guess would be we'd have to look into the Bible. Well, that would be a good guess. Um, I'd like to read you a scripture in the Bible if you have a few minutes. Okay, yes. Okay. Well, it's at Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 to 31. And it says, Two sparrows sell for a coin of small value, do they not? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's knowledge. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So have no fear. You are worth more than many sparrows. Hmm. So the human head is said to average about 100,000 hairs. So what does this tell you about how God feels about you? I don't even know how many hairs I have on my head. So it would mean that God knows a lot about me. And he does. Well, it also says that God notices when a very small bird falls. Mm. But then how does that scripture compare that with you? Well, I guess it means that I'm worth more than many sparrows or small birds. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So if God cares about what happens to a small bird, and you are worth more than many small birds, do you think God cares about you? Well, it seems he cares, but if he does care, why doesn't he do anything about my suffering or problems? When I care about someone, I want to help them. Ah, and that is an excellent question. You know, the Bible does promise that one day God will take care of, take away all of our suffering. But in the meantime, the Bible also says that God helps us to cope with our problems until then. Would you be interested in learning about that? You know, I really would. Okay, great. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time at work. So is there another phone number I can get to reach you after work? Yes, of course. Okay. Thank you very much, sisters. Excellent job on that uh, sample conversation for the initial call. And uh, we uh, did a very nice job with that. The uh, sister, Dady, you were asked to work on study number three, which is use of questions. And we noticed you use many questions in that brief presentation, but why do we do it? Because we wanna reach the listener's heart and we need to know what's on their minds before we can help them, help, help them see how the kingdom message can help them with their, the problems that they're facing. And you did that throughout the talk, but I would especially wanna highlight how you did it after reading the scripture. You ask questions, personal questions that highlighted the importance of that scripture. You said, so how does God feel about you? And what, what is God, uh, how detailed of uh, interest does God have in you according to the scripture? So use that you, you, you through the, throughout the questions. So I helped personalize it and helped her to see that it, it was something that really applied to her and she could take it to heart. So thank you very much for that fine job. Now we'll see another demonstration of our initial call. And this time it'll be by sisters Stephanie Frausto and Allie Ambrose. Hi there, my name is Stephanie, may I ask yours? Hi, I'm Allie. Hi Allie, nice to meet you. I'm calling to share an encouraging thought with you today. 
it seems that we can all used to hear something encouraging. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, sure. I have a few minutes to talk. Oh, great. Um, you know, when something challenging or tragic happens to us personally, some ask or wonder to themselves if God even notices. Is that something that you've thought before? Yeah, definitely. You know, I guess when I watch the news, I understand why God would care about large world events, but I never really considered that he would even be very interested in me personally. Yeah, I can understand that. And I know that many feel the same way. I know I have at times too. Um, you know, our everyday life may feel really insignificant, our daily routine. Um, but, you know, the Bible assures us that that's not how God feels. Notice what Jesus said about how much his father cares about us. It's at Matthew 10, 29 through 31. And it says, two sparrows sell for a coin of small value, do they not? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's knowledge. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So have no fear, you are worth more than many sparrows. So Ali, Jesus is telling us that his father cares about small birds. What happens to them if they fall, he notices he really cares. But what, does, what else does Jesus say about our value? Did you happen to catch it? Uh, I think he said that you're worth more than sparrows. Exactly. Yeah. So here Jesus is giving us this visual to think about. Um, so let's go ahead and do that for a minute. Let me ask you to imagine just when you're walking down the street, do you always um, stop to listen intently when you hear a bird singing or to stop and watch it fly or find something to eat? <laughs> Definitely not. You know, sometimes I don't even realize that they're there. Yeah, we're just too busy. We're going about our routine. But isn't it amazing that something that to us may seem really small or insignificant at times, like a bird, does not go unnoticed by God? Again, Jesus told us in Matthew that we are worth far more than many sparrows. So after considering just this one scripture, do you think that God cares about us individually, cares about you? Well, it does seem like that. Um, and that's a really nice thought. And I never really think about things like that. Yeah, isn't it? I'm glad that you found that comforting. You know, maybe I can call again. And next time we can consider that since God does care about us, how then can he help us to cope with our problems when they come up? Yeah, I would like that. You know, to help with that, Ali, I would like to share a booklet with you that helps us to find key points that bring comfort from the Bible. It's called Enjoy Life Forever. Is this your cell phone number? Yes, this is my number. Um, I could text you a link to that if it's okay. You know, I'm not sure if I really want to commit to getting a brochure. Okay, um, that's okay. But, you know, you seem to have a real appreciation for the Bible, um, I'm not sure if you've ever considered studying it or looking deeper into it, but even in just a few minutes today, we were able to consider something that's not only comforting, but also practical for us. I do have a video I'd like to show you um, so you can see how this type of study could be beneficial for you. It's called Why Study the Bible. Is that something I can share with you? Yeah, send it on over. Okay, I'll go ahead and do that now. I'll watch it real quick. You know, that video brought out things that I never really thought about. Actually, if it's still an offer, can I see that brochure? Yeah, definitely. I'll go ahead and send the link over to you. You know, I really enjoyed our conversation and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Okay, I did too. Thank you very much, sisters, for that fine ex example of a uh, initial call. And Sister Frausto, you were asked to work on study nine, appropriate use of visual aids. And uh, while well, we had the visual aid, you had it all right there in your uh, part suggested that of the video, why study the Bible. But what it says there in the summary, it says use visual aids to make important points of instruction more vivid. So if you drop down to the box in the ministry, it says direct the listener, a listener's attention to artwork in a publication and ask him to comment on what he sees, ask additional questions as needed to emphasize key ideas. And then when playing a video, turn the screen to face your listener. And generally it's not necessary to talk while the video is playing. So 
so good good reminders for us regarding the playing of videos. Well, we obviously right now during the pandemic we don't have probably hardly any opportunities to actually show a video firsthand to someone, but to at least be able to confirm that they got it and then make the link to what we're trying to do next. And that, of course, is starting a study with them, which you did and made a nice link to that and in using the Enjoy Life brochure. So thank you very much for your work with that. And uh, thank all our participants who uh, had a part today. Now we're gonna transition into our Living as Christians meeting. And uh, it's one of our parts is going to focus on the marriage arrangement, the loyalty that is needed there. So let's sing song 131, appropriately entitled, What God Has Yoked Together, song 131. Now let's give our attention to Brother Stanley Beatty as he uh, covers the part, The Bible Saved Our Marriage. At 1 Corinthians 7, verse 28, Paul warns that those desiring to get married will have tribulation in their flesh. But what did he mean by tribulation? And think about what getting married involves. It involves setting up a new household, and that process can strain the family relationship. How so? For one, they have to adjust, the couple, that is, has to adjust to new roles. They now have to deal with in-laws. They may have demanding employment, and possibly they may be raising children. These are just a few of the external factors that may cause stress, that may strain their relationship. Think of the internal factors. They'll have hurt feelings at times, misunderstandings, miscommunications, and their imperfect tongue can lead to a challenge even in the best of marriages. With all these expected tribulations, is it possible for a couple to succeed in their marriage? Yes. In that same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul said in verse 37 that a married man could do well. How? By applying Bible principles. In this video, we'll see how two couples were able to use the Bible to help save their troubled marriages. After watching the video, we'll have a brief discussion to see what specific biblical principles help them. Let's give our attention to the video. Can the Bible save a marriage that's in danger? The following interviews, while very frank, will show the exceeding value of God's own word, the Bible, to preserve that divine union. Almost from the start of the marriage, it was not running smoothly, to say the least. We were fighting constantly. 
uh, even the smallest things we would we would argue over uh, and it would just get blown out of proportion. We couldn't communicate without it being an argument. Steadily the arguments increased in frequency um, and intensity. And you think well I'm not happy here um, and that's when yeah, well, I threatened to leave. Sometimes I felt like completely giving up on the marriage. There would be arguments where you're packing the bags and saying you'd wish you'd never done it. Ultimately, it would end in insults and... Jehovah was missing out of our marriage and that was the essential part of making our marriage work. A, a brother and sister that we'd known for a long time initially offered us a Bible study. They invited us to their family worship evening, have dinner, do the watchtower with them which we accepted. The family worship arrangement helped because it wasn't just a, a Bible principle that you read about, but we saw them being applied in this couple's life. And so all of a sudden, I could see the cause and effect of, of a Bible principle. But the impact that it was having was, was tremendous because we could see how to apply a Bible principle and make it work. I think it took a long time before things got better honestly, but um, the turning point was coming back to Jehovah. There were many principles that all of a sudden were like little light bulbs going off. Jesus in John 13, 34, when he recommended his example. Ephesians 5, 33 eventually had an impact on me because there were articles that pointed out how important it is for a husband to feel respected by his wife. And I don't think I'd ever really appreciated that before. I just viewed it as a mechanical process. He's the head, he needs to have respect from his wife. I didn't recognise that it's important for a husband to feel respected, to then be able to take on his role as head. We're so thankful to Jehovah for his, his patience. The Bible principles were always there. Uh, we just weren't making application of them. As soon as we started to make application, our marriage did a complete turnaround. Where we are now is, is totally different. The, the relationship that we have is what we wanted in the start but didn't know how to get it. It's just that application of Bible principles that's made it possible. We were 17 actually when we met, 20 when we got married. Life was good for Tony and I, we, mm. were, we were happy. But then I got into another business that uh, became the main focus in my life. It had a, quite a dramatic effect on our spirituality. We went through it some time there where we hardly saw each other. So there was a great deal of time that we spent apart. Bible principles were ones that weren't brought into our life. At that time, Bible reading was out of the picture. I started delving into viewing things that were really, really inappropriate. And, and then it eventually happened where I didn't really care what I viewed. And I didn't think about the consequences and of the unhappiness that it would cause. It made me feel very, um, extremely unloved. I felt very angry about his behavior I felt a lot of resentment towards him, a lot of bitterness. We ended up in um, separation to begin with. I left Tony, I walked away from him, I walked away from the marriage, walked away from the business, and eventually it ended up with me unscripturally divorcing Tony. The elders that were uh, assisting me, they helped me to see exactly how Jehovah felt about what I'd been doing, where my relationship was with him and it was quite poor. I felt due to the betrayal that I had experienced, I did not have a problem with my conscience at all in going through the divorce. It seemed the logical and the best way for me to go. Then with my Bible reading, I got to see Amos 5, 15. It really had an effect on me because I needed to hate what is bad and love what is good. One scripture that affected me was how Jehovah felt about divorce from Malachi. All together, it took us 15 years before we got together again. Mm. I was just enjoying a day out in the field midweek and I uh, get home in mid-afternoon and all of a sudden my mobile phone rang and uh, I heard Rhonda's voice and 
What a delight it was when she was inviting me to accompany her to a cup of coffee somewhere to talk about things. If I didn't start having the scriptural intake and learning to love God's word, uh, my life wouldn't have changed. Without the Bible, Tony and I would not be together. Mm. Um, the marriage would never ever have reconciled. We have become best friends, so we really enjoy being in each other's company and um, serving Jehovah together. Married life now has certainly been benefited between both of us to see how beneficial the scriptures were. Tony and I now are very much a couple, and so no matter what we deal with, it's, it's us together. When situations like these arise, it's not just our marriage that's affected. Our relationship with Jehovah is on the line. Our dear sister, for example, reached an emotional point where she felt the only solution was an unscriptural divorce. As we make our decisions in marriage, Jehovah's feelings on the subject found at Malachi chapter 2, verse 16 should be carefully considered. For I hate divorce, says Jehovah, the God of Israel. If you find your marital peace is threatened, review articles like the one in the May 15, 2012 study edition of The Watchtower, entitled, Take a Positive View of a Strained Marriage. It provides powerful counsel that can help to save and strengthen your marriage bond. Well, our first question for the review is, which Bible principles helped each couple to save their marriage? Let's start with Sister Frostow. Well, I appreciated the first sister um, said that Ephesians 5.33 really had an impact on her and about how a husband really needs to feel um, respected. It's not just a mechanical thing that comes along with um, his role as a head, but when she realized that um, her actions by respecting him actually can make a difference for him performing his role better. Yeah, thank you. And Brother Grimes, please. And I appreciated our second couple, uh, the sister uh, felt like she was completely justified in getting an unscriptural divorce because of her, the betrayal that she had to dealt with, deal with. But when she focused on the Bible principle in Malachi 2.16 that talks about how Jehovah hates a divorcing, then she realized that it was beneficial for her to try to um, reconcile the, the differences in, in, in their marriage. And, and it took a while. I think uh, they didn't get together uh, till after some 15 years, but by applying Bible principles, they were able to uh, get back together again and make the marriage work. Yeah, thank you. And someone from the, uh, Brother Ambrose, please, thank you. Well, with the second couple, the, the husband, he was engaging in practices that were not right. And that was something that was also causing the wife distress and a friction in the marriage. So he applied Amos chapter five, verse 15, which was, hey, what is bad and love? What is good? So once he was able to hate that bad practice, it really helped in the marriage uh, because he was doing good and what Jehovah loves. Good. Thank you. And there was one more. Uh, Sister Dady, please. Well, the first couple, the brother mentioned John 13, 34, um, that you need to have love one another so that that kind of love was missing in their marriage so that that principle helped them to focus on on making sure that they they had that thank you so much uh the next question how did restoring a good spiritual routine help them let's go with someone from the grimes household please sister grimes well, their spiritual routine came to play a part. I appreciated with both couples that when they individually began to do more spiritually, they didn't see the faults necessarily in their mate, but within themselves where they lack and where they could rely upon Jehovah to make change, to make things improve. And it was nice with the first couple too, how um, they commented not only knowing the Bible principles, but seeing it in actions by other mature couples who were applying in Bible principles. Very fine. And one more, Brother Harrison, please. 
and filling their lives with spiritual things can help to push out time spent doing less desirable. Uh, the husband of the second couple mentioned that because he wasn't reading his Bible, he began to view inappropriate. That's how he filled his time. So we see the benefit of doing things spiritually and keep our minds focused on good things and on the right track. Thank you so much. And again, we saw it was specifically called out in the video, family worship and uh, regular Bible reading. Our third question, why must couples not give up in combating marital problems? Sister Sawyer, please. Uh, one of the most important reasons is because um, our relationship with Jehovah is affected uh, for each person in the marriage. And of course, we know Jehovah has already written in the Bible clearly that he hates a divorcing. So um, it really shows that, yes, there will be struggles because of imperfection in marriage, but um, definitely applying Bible principles and keeping Jehovah in it will help them to combat marital problems. Great. Thank you. And where can couples seek spiritual help? Brother Sierra, please. As we saw with the example of the second couple, the brother sought help of the elders and they helped him to correct his thinking and to restore his uh, relationship with Jehovah and with his spouse. Thank you so much. Friends, it's important we remember that these situations, as was mentioned in the video, don't just affect our marriage, but our relationship with Jehovah. So if we're struggling or having issues with our marriage, uh, one of the article that was mentioned that we, uh, as a reminder, we might want to take note of May 15, 2012, the article of the um, Watch Hour, that's May 15, 2012, Watch Hour article that was entitled, Take a Positive View of a Strained Marriage. If our marriage is threatened, let us pray intensely, let's scrutinize our own motives honestly, and consider the scriptures carefully, and seek the spiritual assistance of the elders. Above all, May we be determined to please Jehovah in all things and show real appreciation for his wonderful gift of marriage. Thank you very much, Brother Dady. Fine job with that. Nice practical information for all married couples to, to keep in mind. Now we're going to give our attention to our congregation Bible study. So let's give our attention now to Brother Leroy Grimes. Well, we'd like to welcome everyone in attendance attendance to our congregation Bible study. We're going to look forward to a very encouraging uh, discussion um, today. So um, as we began our discussion last week in the chapter, my great rage will flare up. We discussed how God, Jehovah is a God of love. He's merciful and compassionate and slow to anger. However, he is also capable of great rage. Now, should knowing this thought scare us? No, because Jehovah rage actually benefits his people, and it has benefited his servants in the past. And that's what we're going to discuss tonight and see how we can, of course, benefit and be encouraged by it. We, of course, look forward to everyone's well-prepared and uh, thought-out comments so um, at this moment in time, we're going to give our attention to uh, the reading of paragraphs 9 and 10, and we'll have Brother Stephen Harrison do that for us. Reason. Jehovah's faithful people are threatened. Jehovah is provoked to anger when enemies attack those who loyally seek shelter under his protective care. For example, after the Israelites fled Egypt, Pharaoh and his mighty army descended on the seemingly helpless people huddled on the shore of the Red Sea. But when that powerful military force chased the Israelites across the dry seabed, Jehovah took the wheels off the war chariots and shook the Egyptians off into the sea. Not so much as one among them was allowed to survive. Jehovah's anger blazed against the Egyptians because of his loyal love for his people. Likewise, Jehovah's love for his people prompted him to act in the days of King Hezekiah. The Assyrians, the most powerful and brutal military force of the day, had marched on the city of Jerusalem. Jehovah's loyal servants were threatened with a siege that would lead to a slow, horrible death. In response, Jehovah sent just one angel. He killed 185,000 enemy soldiers in a single night. 
Imagine the scene in the Assyrian camp the following morning. Spears, shields, and swords lie untouched. No trumpets wake the men, no orders rally the troops. An eerie silence hangs over steel tents and an encampment strewn with corpses. Excellent reading. Thank you, Brother Harrison. Before we get the answer to our question on paragraphs 9 and 10, perhaps we can have a volunteer read for us Exodus chapter 15, verses 9 through 13. Sister Dady, please. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide spoil until I am satisfied. I will draw my sword, my hand will subdue them. You blew with your breath, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in majestic waters. Who among the gods is like you, O Jehovah? Who is like you, showing yourself mighty in holiness? The one to be feared with songs of praise, the one doing wonders. You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them up. In your loyal love, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy place of dwelling. Very good. Thank you, Sister Dady. And we can keep that scripture in mind as we comment on paragraphs 9 and 10. The question asks, how does Jehovah respond when his faithful people are threatened? Give examples. Brother Sierra, please. Well, throughout this book, we've seen different different uh, personalities from Jehovah, how a loving father that he is there to comfort us. But in this occasion, in Exodus 15, 9-13, we see that he's a mighty warrior ready to defend his people. We see all the action that he's going to take when his people are threatened. That's very good. Thank you, Brother Sierra. Sister Grimes, please. Also, um, in verse 13, when it mentions Jehovah loyal love, we appreciate that this type of love is motivated by a commitment or a deep attachment. And it's an expression of love that can only be displayed toward humans, not inanimate things. So the fact that Jehovah shows loyal love toward his servants um, is something that he does willingly on his part. It's nothing that we have control over. Excellent. Very good. So, so even though Jehovah um, can display anger, it's motivated by his loyal love. Very good comment. Brother Oliveris, please. Yeah, and we saw, again, highlighting that example, Jehovah fighting for his people when he protected them from Pharaoh and his armies who were chasing after them. They seemed defenseless, and Jehovah intervened, and he delivered his, again, his loyal people because he loves them. And uh, in 1425, Jehovah kept taking the wheels off their chariots, so they were driving them with difficulty. And even the Egyptians recognized Jehovah was defending his people. And they said, let us flee from any contact with Israel because Jehovah is fighting for them against the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Brother Olivares. Brother Sawyer, please. We see why we really needed to have Jehovah's loyal love because the scripture there in Exodus 15, 9 through 13, the enemy the egyptian says i will pursue i will overtake i will divide spoil until i am satisfied i will draw my sword my hand will subdue them so they were uh, so confident that they could overtake jehovah's people they were pretty much helpless on their own but because of jehovah's powerful loyal love he rescued them mm -hmm. very good sister Dady. Another example in paragraph 10 is when the Assyrians came up against Jerusalem and they were going to siege the city, and which would lead to the Israelites having a slow, horrible death. But we can see how Jehovah was moved to step in and he completely protected his people. All he did was send in one angel and this angel killed all of the enemy soldiers in one night. So he didn't leave any, any of the enemy behind. Mm -hmm. So we see that picture there attached to... Uh paragraph 10 uh, of an angel there. What does that scripture um, teach us or guarantee us? Uh, Brother Sierra? We have full confidence in Jehovah's uh, power to save. It's almost like the bigger the threat, 
the more of a guarantee Jehovah is going to save us. Yes, excellent comment. Thank you. Let's move on to paragraph 11. Lessons. Those examples of how Jehovah reacts when his people are threatened provide a graphic warning to our enemies. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God when his wrath is provoked. For us, these same examples bring comfort and foster courage. We gain comfort from knowing that our main enemy, Satan, will not succeed. Soon his short period of dominance will end. Until then, we can serve Jehovah with courage, confident that no individual, organization, or government can prevent us from doing God's will. The Apostle Paul expressed our conviction with these inspired words, if God is for us, who will be against us? Thank you. So before we get the question to paragraph 11, maybe we can have a volunteer read for us the 118 Psalm verses six through nine. Sister Sawyer, please. Jehovah is on my side. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Jehovah is on my side as my helper. I will look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in Jehovah than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in Jehovah than to trust in princes. Very good. Thank you, Sister Sawyer. So the question on paragraph 11, what comfort and courage do we gain from scriptural examples of how Jehovah reacts when his people are threatened? You can keep in mind the 118 song. Uh, Brother Ambrose, please. Yeah, there in the 118 Psalm, it talks about how Jehovah is on our side. So uh, we see that in our scriptural examples. Jehovah has always been on the side of his people. And what we saw as a result then was that the enemies were never successful against them. So we can take comfort in that. Excellent. Thank you, Brother Ambrose. Brother Frostville, please. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, quoted there in the paragraph, it actually tells us that the fearful part of it is being on the opposing side. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God, Jehovah. So we take comfort knowing we're fully protected. Uh, they have something to worry about. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for tying in that scripture. Sister Sawyer? And I like the thought in Romans 8, 31, where the apostle Paul said with such conviction, if God is for us, who will be against us? Mm -hmm. Very good. Let's move on to paragraph 12, please. During the coming great tribulation, Jehovah will act to protect us, just as he did the Israelites trapped by the Egyptians and the Jews in Jerusalem besieged by the Assyrians. When our enemies try to destroy us, Jehovah's deep love for us will cause his rage to flare up. Those who are foolish enough to attack us will, in effect, be touching the pupil of Jehovah's eye. His response will be swift and decisive. The resulting carnage will be unprecedented. But God's enemies will have no valid cause to be surprised when Jehovah unleashes his wrath on them. Why not? So during the Great Tribulation, what will cause Jehovah's rage to flare up? Sister Grimes, please. Well, this will be just like with the Egyptians and also with the Assyrians when they went to attack Jehovah's people, the Israelites and the Jews. Likewise, in the future, God's enemies will bring on an attack against his people. And this will be like touching the pupil of Jehovah's eye, which will get a response of swift and decisive action. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Brother or Sister Frosto? In the paragraph there, just building on Sister Grimes' comment there, it says that there are those that are foolish enough to attack us will, will get this swift, decisive action from Jehovah. So we see the, the fallacy of their thinking there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very good. Now let's move on to our next subtopic and see why the enemies of uh, Jehovah should not be surprised when he does attack them. The subtopic is what warnings has Jehovah given? We'll have the reading of paragraph 13. Jehovah is slow to anger 
and has given ample warnings that he will destroy those who oppose him and threaten his people. Jehovah used such prophets as Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Christ Jesus, and the apostles Peter, Paul, and John to warn of a great climatic battle. Very good, thank you. So what warnings has Jehovah given? And perhaps we can incorporate comments from our teaching box 18a, Jehovah warns of the coming great battle. Brother M. Breeze, please. Well, Jehovah gives warnings to those who oppose him and threaten his people. And, and the warning that he gives them is that he's not going to tolerate anymore. He's going to destroy them. But the nice thing, too, is it's not something that he said, I'm going to do it tomorrow. But he actually gives them plenty of time to advance warning. Exactly. Very good. Brother Olivares, please. And we see that in Exodus 34, uh, 6 and 7, it brings out Jehovah is very merciful and compassionate, but it also says he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And, uh, and he's slow to anger. So we can sum it up this way, uh, that he shows firmness when necessary and mercy whenever possible, or, or when there is a basis for doing so. But if people don't pay attention to the warnings he gives, he's not going to tolerate uh, forever those who oppose and threaten his people. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very good. And, and so in our teaching box there, Jehovah warns of the coming great battle. Throughout history, how have we seen Jehovah um, warn um, those of, 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 of his coming destruction? Sister Sawyer, please. Well, one example in the days of ancient Israel, Jeremiah 25, 31 through 33 mentioned that Jehovah would pass judgment on all humans and he would put uh, the wicked to the sword. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very good. Brother Sawyer, please. And in the first century CE, we see Jesus talked about a coming great tribulation. Paul talked about vengeance on those who do not know God. Peter talked about the earth and its works being exposed. And then John uh, mentioned that Jesus, out of Jesus' mouth, would protrude a sharp, long sword to strike the nations. So we see the ample warning being given back in the first century. Mm -hmm. Very good. And what do we see happening in our time? Brother Sierra, please. Now, in modern times, we see Jehovah's people are making known uh, Jehovah's warnings. As long as, as far as the Bible is concerned, we have the most distributed copy of that, of our version of the Bible. And we spend hundreds of millions of hours each year also uh, warning, giving the warning signs, declaring the good news. Even during Zoom, uh, during the pandemic, we found different ways uh, to reach and to give, to give this warning and to continue to preach the, the message. Very good. So even though Jehovah is a God that is capable of, of great anger, we see that because of his love for people, he wants to warn as many as possible so that they can be saved. And he has organized the people in our day and time to do that. Very good. Now let's move on to paragraphs 14 and 15 and discuss more about what God is, is currently doing. Jehovah had these warnings recorded in his word. He also ensured that the Bible would become the most widely translated and distributed book in history. Throughout the earth, he has raised an army of volunteers who help others learn how to make peace of God and who warn of the coming great day of Jehovah. He has motivated his people to translate Bible study publications into hundreds of languages and to spend hundreds of millions of hours each year talking about the promises and the warnings found in his word. Jehovah has had all this work done because he does not desire anyone to be destroyed, but desires all to attain to repentance. What a privilege we have to re represent our loving, patient God and to play a small spark part in spreading his message. 
Soon, however, time will run out for those who do not pay attention to the warnings. Very good. Thank you for your excellent reading, Brother Harrison. We certainly appreciated it. So the question on paragraphs 14 and 15, what work has Jehovah done and why? And feel free to tie in uh, the cited scriptures there in, in, in the, that are in the paragraph. Sister Grimes, please. Well, Jehovah has had his word, the Bible that he inspired, um, translated into hundreds, even thousands of hundreds of languages. Um, but it's reaching people of thousands of languages where they're able to, in harmony, like with Psalms 2, 10 through 12, um, we're encouraged to honor the son or come or God will become indignant. Um, so this is allowing people, even of small languages, um, where it's not a lot of people, Jehovah have seen fit to have his word translated available to them so that they have opportunity to know of Jesus as well as himself for salvation. Very good. Thank you for tying in that scripture. Uh, Sister Frost, though, please. In the Psalms 110.3, talks about Jehovah's people offering themselves willingly. And so he ha truly has raised an army of volunteers. And so this warning is something that we get to be a part of um, as well by doing the preaching work. Excellent. Sister Dady. So we wonder why has Jehovah had all of this work done? And it's because Jehovah always warns the unrighteous before passing judgment so that they can't say that they didn't know. Um, but primarily because it's 2 Peter 3.9, um, he also does not want anyone to be destroyed. And so he wants them to be warned so that they have a chance to repent. Mm -hmm. Very good. Brother Sierra, please. And in physical warfare, uh, the usually you never try to show your strategies to the opposer. But that's not how Jehovah works. His main purpose is to save all those, even his opposers. And that's why... As Sister Dady mentioned in 2 Peter verse 3 and 9, Jehovah desires all not to be destroyed, but to be saved. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good point. And so just to reemphasize, what privilege do we have as, as God's people, as his witnesses today? Brother M. Breeze, please. Well, we have the privilege of representing Jehovah and to show others about his love. And we spread this message and, and help others to come to know him, but ultimately also have their lives saved. Mm -hmm. Very good. But uh, Brother Frosto, please. Yeah, that, that box we looked at earlier there says that Jehovah ensured that all mankind has the opportunity to hear and allow them time to act. And it's our job to make sure that they hear this message. Yes, very good. Brother Dady. Just from a, a practical way, uh, as was mentioned, we can be involved with the preaching work, but um, the Bible and its Bible study aids need to be translated, printed, and distributed uh, by our donations. We could also assist in ensuring that this message is spread uh, to every possible person. Yes, very good. Of course, uh, as 2 Peter 3 9 brings out, God is patience. But in time, his patience, patience will run out and uh, time will run out for those who do not pay attention to the warnings as is brought out at the end of paragraph 15. And so that leads to the question, when will Jehovah's flame, anger flare up and how will he express his rage? That's going to be discussed for us next week as we conclude this very exciting chapter 18, My Great Rage Will Flare Up. We thank you all for your excellent, well-prepared comments. Thank you very much, Brother Grimes, and all of you for your excellent comments that help to encourage us to see how Jehovah really shows his loyal love to us and how he will show it very soon. Well, we've enjoyed a fine program today. What have we learned? What are some takeaway points? Well, we've learned a lot about loyalty, haven't we? We need to avoid the contemptible betray betrayal that was demonstrated by Delilah. And married couples can take this to heart. They need to be fully present, fully communicative in their relationship with each other. 
and all of us in the congregate congregation need to abide by Jehovah's command not to have contact with anyone who is disfellowshipped. For married couples, we learned how they need to be loyal to, to each other. And even if they're experiencing uh, strains in their marriage, they need to work hard to apply Bible principles to save their marriage because God hates divorce. And what a privilege we have to be part of a, a great warning work just before Jehovah takes action to destroy this wicked system of things. And what do we have to look forward to next week? Well, we're going to talk about obedience. We're going to learn about a man named Micah, not the prophet Micah, another one, uh, who disobeyed several of God's laws, and we'll see the sad outcome that he experienced. And then young ones, you'll be asked the question, why should you obey your parents? We're going to do this with the help of a Become Jehovah's Friend video. And then in our congregation Bible study, we'll answer this question. What should our knowledge of Jehovah's Day motivate us to do? So we look forward to that next week. For now, we can conclude our meeting by singing a song of praise to Jehovah. And it's, in, it's song number 149, and it's entitled A Victory Song. And it's going to highlight how Jehovah is going to show loyal love to his people at Armageddon. Song 149, and then we'll conclude with prayer. Mm -hmm. 